I'm going to sow some seeds to get you thinking that will hopefully get you to listen to the next speakers in a slightly different way than you would ordinarily and maybe give you some questions that you'd like to capture for this afternoon's workshop session. So the aim is to try and get the juices flowing, the intellectual juices flowing in a slightly different way. First of all, I don't uh, necessarily expect you to be able to read all of that at the back because I've gone to the back, it's a little bit small, but I'm a little bit old and blind, so maybe that's okay. Um, so organisations of people at the glance, to give you some statistics, I can send you almost all of these slides, there's only a couple that NHS England have asked me not to actually, not to actually send out directly. Um, forgive the acoustics. Um, I think you know most of the information um, on this slide anyway in terms of numbers. Is this working now? Mm -hmm. um, I think you know most of the numbers. I think the, the critical ones to pick out though, which to be honest were a bit of a surprise to me, this is an NHS England slide, um, were the, the bottom two. So there are a lot more doctors now than there were 10 years ago. And I hadn't quite appreciated just how many more there were. So that was quite surprising. I know we all talk about the money in the NHS has gone up and the biggest asset of the NHS, as well as its biggest drain in terms of financial requirement resources, is the staff. Now, that was quite a surprise to me if you look at just how much it's grown. So it's grown by about 40,000 more individual <coughs> doctors in 10 years, which is an average, um, I haven't checked the maths, I did wonder about this, but it, apparently it's an average of about 3% over that time. So 3%, 3%, 3% cumulative adds up to that kind of number. And then um, nurses also increased a lot, but nowhere near, uh, uh, nowhere near the same kind of a level. But those are quite interesting. So as I say, that's one of the ones I can send out anyway. I'll tell you the ones that we, we can't, so you can take more notes if you need to. Um, then we come on to the five-year forward view, which does contain some very important information, that's why I didn't want to um, reduce this slide. So uh, apologies for the wordiness, but I, I don't think we should apologise because it's important. First of all, this was published late last year. It's um, a view of the system that's accepted by government. So this is the plan. Um, it was developed across various agencies, including Monitor, NHS England, the Trust Development Authority, the if you've read the news, you'll have seen a whole range of trusts that have actually amalgamated, merged, some closed down. And in the last government, we heard that there wouldn't be NHS hospitals closing down, which is interesting how it, it kind of happened by stealth. I was astonished that there were, there were, there were more press reports saying my local hospital is closing or merging. I was really surprised, but there are lots of them that have merged. Um, new provider flexible configurations outlined in Dalton Review. Um, not an awful lot of detail in there though, it was just opening the door for providing change, which is not really a surprise. Uh, PBR tariff was held up as part of the solution, but I think we've all found that in part it's been a bit of a failure. It's not very transparent, it's not very consistent. Is it really reflective of the whole patient care pathway for certain disease areas? From personal experience, categorically not. And some NHS trusts have done very well, some have done very poorly, and it's a complete mishmash. Um, so there's a tend towards uh, capitated risk-based integrated care payments. I'm not sure whether that will be a wholesale shift or whether it will be somewhere in the middle. Personally, I suspect it will be somewhere in the middle. Talking to people at Monitor, I don't get the sense that they're expecting PDR to actually peak away and disappear in the next two three years. <coughs> um, there'll be a big gap, which we'll come on to, the funding gap. Um, the, the baseline funding of around 95 billion plus PHE and other things uh, adding up to over 100 billion. Um, it, it, we spend a lot of money on health, as we all know. Since the 50s, health spend run rate has been about 3%, but it was 8% in 2009 10, which is a bit worrying when you're considering trying to get, um, trying to get some uh, efficiency savings. Flat real growth in the comprehensive spending review and, and beyond is an overall fall in proportion of GDP. That, that's quite an important point that even if we keep things flat, as a nation, we're dropping our health spend per GDP. And if you look at us compared to other nations, we're already not particularly high in the charts. Where does this put us in five years? And I think from a market access perspective, we need to understand that and understand what that means for our customers. If you were saying earlier on, what does market access mean for our customers? Well, it partly means putting up a barrier to innovation, or it means filtering innovation to get the best, most cost-effective things, the things that can free up more resources as quickly as possible um, earlier. 
The do nothing projection assumes a 10 year average growth of less than, uh, sorry, minus 2.5%, two, two which is um, already pretty worrying because we know from previous growth projections that's not realistic. And the best case scenario, the 8 billion residual funding gap, assumes that are actually around about 3% efficiency between now and 2021. <coughs> that's unlikely to happen considering our best case, uh, sorry, our best average in the last 20 years has been 1.5%. So that's quite a thought provoking point. The worst case is actually around about 21, 22 billion funding gap within the next six years. I don't know about you, but the taxpayer, that's a little worrying. If we move to NHS England innovation, so, or rather, evolution, <laughs> or what's the plan? So the plan at NHS England is to look in the mirror and own up to the fact maybe we've got it slightly wrong with specialised diseases. Maybe we took on too much, it was all sexy and interesting, and maybe we, we just bit off more than we could chew. Therefore, CCGs have been invited to do a whole host of things. One of the first things is to look at three different modalities for, uh, for commissioning in the future. One is no change, which less than 10 CCGs opted for. Another one is money saved for any procurement or commissioning decisions put through a committee in common, which is a legal term, but it's, it's an important one that we'll come back to. Around, I'm getting some feedback here, I hope I'm not here, definitely. <laughs> um, around 140 CCGs took this approach which is really important. So the bulk of CCDs took that approach. It's not a waste of time, but it's a stepping stone to some kind of a fully delegated position. Um, I'm gonna have to move away from it, just in case. So, um, the NHS retains payment of GPs by a very small team, but the function and management of those teams is, all those contracts, is, is done, um, it, it's kind of done uh, centrally, to try and take off some of the stress from primary care. But what happens to specialised services, and this is where we haven't got a lot of clarity at the moment, but we're hoping to add some today, and I'd be really um, interested in what you think about that. So, where are we now? We've gone past the election. Um, we've got a problem, because the Health and Social Care Act uh, states that um, CCGs need to be the holders of the money. Now they can come together in strategic planning groups or clusters of CCGs, which is happening. Um, but the problem that's created is that NHS England can't stroke once just hand over 13 or 14 billion pounds worth of money to individual CCGs without some way of coming together formally to try and risk share or manage that, that pot. So what are the solutions? There's one solution. <coughs> which is called the Legislative Reform Order. Uh, and this allows um, people to do more things than they could before. So the NHS Act allows a couple of CCGs to come together to exercise some functions. Um, there's no provision, though, to allow them to form joint committees. So it's a bit clunky. It requires a lot of cooperation, a lot of voluntary working uh, teamwork, which you would hope the NHS is good at. Therefore, they're not able to come together like PCTs did, to say we're an independent legal entity, we can move together and do things on our own. Um, there are practical challenges that, uh, in, in being unable to make decisions as a group. Now, those cut across boundaries, they, they cause lots of problems with equity. So if you can't come, as, come together as a legal entity as a group and make decisions that are legally binding, you then end up with a kind of almost postcode post lottery, depending on who shouts loudest. And we've all been in companies or situations whereby your budget is protected depending on how, how loud you shout. And that's not really something any of us want, I think, for the NHS. So joint commissioning is likely to play a big part in the future. I'll also send out uh, these couple of slides because this one's um, probably important as a reference for you. Because I'm not going to read this, but there's a whole load of stuff in here that's quite helpful in the sense of what people can do. And one of the things that the legislative reform order under the le legislation last year allows people to do is it abolishes the need for committees in common and expensive, time consuming <coughs> legal advice. Now, we have an in house lawyer. Lawyers are very good, we like them, but they are quite expensive. They don't want to use them for everything. Um, 
the other thing that it does is create a clear decision making for you, which allows you to get to potentially some of the solutions that hopefully you can kind of read up here. So one solution is to get CTGs to play nicely. You come together as a group, as a collaborative, um, on the basis of around one to one and a half million people. The problem with that is it's voluntary and the things I just laid out in the back of the team uh, and kind of postcode lottery, etc. The second option is to mandate change, but that's only really meant to be used when CTGs fail. So I'm not really sure that that's a, a viable solution. And I just England don't think so. So they've kind of planned for it using some of that, uh, the previous slides, uh, order provisions. The CCG formula will stay, the cable formula will be adapted to some degree probably, and they have plans to develop a specific algorithm for specialised services. That's quite important because the bottom point is, is particularly relevant. We have to remember how we got to where we are if we're going to try and figure out where we're going to. And how we got to where we are is a little bit by chance, a little bit by thinking it's a good idea to club all the specialised things together because they generally don't happen everywhere all at once. Therefore, there is risk. Let's take that risk out of the system. It's a very good idea. It should work. But the way the money was top sliced, the way the money was allocated to NHS England, was on the basis of one point in time. And that's not likely to reflect the future. It certainly didn't reflect the past. So when they calculated that formula, what they didn't do is say, if we use this formula to decide whether that would have given us enough money two years ago, or five years ago, or ten years ago, would it still be that amount of money? But when they did it afterwards, they realised actually no, that wasn't the case. So they didn't top slice enough money. They also didn't forecast sufficiently how much it was going to cost in the future. So, there's lots of um, delicacy, there's a soft underbelly to the NHS, and we need to be careful how we tinker with it. There's, there's three things that we need to consider. One is the Health and Social Care Act and how we evolve it. So there will be some amendments required. Two is CTGs are going to have to come together one way or another. We kind of know that, but that's not thinking. And the Comprehensive Spending Review Act will be important. So when you're considering how your market access plan should work, and when you're considering how to engage with payers, or clinicians with some kind of payer responsibility, or other people in the NHS that have some bearing on, the, on these issues, you need to have thought about these things. And if you haven't, you've kind of got what you've always got in the past, when you've had one of those bad calls, when you haven't planned very well, and you just kind of go on and you kind of winged it, and we've all done it, and you kind of come out thinking, well, that was a nice chat about the kids and the holidays in Tenerife or wherever it was that you went. But what did we actually achieve? And what we can't afford is for our customers to think that now, because they haven't got time. Because all of this co-commissioning coming together as a collaborative voluntarily, it takes a hell of a lot of time, a hell of a lot of energy. A really good example to learn from is clinical reference groups. So in NHS England, all these CRDs came together. It was a very good idea to have lots of clinical leadership, commissioning leadership, on each specialised disease area. It's a fantastic idea, but none of them are paid. So you end up getting very disenfranchised clinicians and commissioners feeling like, this isn't fair, I'm doing all this extra work, I haven't got any more time to do it, and this doesn't work very well. Now, if co-commissioning goes the same way, you get lots of voluntary requirements to work, if you're going to see customers wasting their time, you're going to get kind of black holes in the way. Um, I'll rattle on there a little bit. What I will um, particularly pick out on this slide is this thing about 23, 24 billion by 2021 again. And that's if savings are modeled based on the past. One and a half percent a year, as I said earlier on, is more likely than the three percent that's needed. And in addition to those savings, NHS England have forecast they need about eight billion pounds to remodel. So there's one thing to save money just to meet the demand of our growing requirements as we get older, more chronic diseases, etc., in the future. But there's also this thing about remodeling the system. Because just remodeling the system takes expensive consultants and lots of work, etc. And the cost of that is forecast to be about 8 billion just to remodel. I was kind of uh, surprised by that a little bit. What the Conservatives have said, you might be able to read at the bottom, I'm not sure, is they said that they would commit at least 8 billion through the next parliament, which covers the remodeling costs, but nothing else. So the at least bit is probably quite important, because that will probably need to double or treble. 
So I'll distract us a little bit to think about medicines for a, for a second, and then we'll, we'll come back to the conclusion. And we'll hand over to, to James. You got a question? That's eight billion pounds. Is that in total over the next five years? The remodeling costs. Yes, the eight billion. Uh, the eight billion that the Conservatives will pledge for. Yes. My understanding is it's total pot. Total it's not eight billion years. per year. No. no. Okay. Because if it were eight billion a year, <clears throat> ta-da, problem solved. <laughs> I think, yeah. Because certainly um, NHS England finance and other teams seem to think that if you were to get, because that's one of my early questions when I first started seeing these numbers banned in the banks, it's very easy to get confused by is that compound, is that annualised, or what does it mean? And when you get into the detail of it, you kind of get quite excited thinking, well, this is easy. If we've got 8 billion a year, then we could solve the problems, and that would work. But as a nation, we don't have 8 billion in the current tax structure to be able to put to this. Not unless you raid other budgets, and you've kind of done a lot of that already. Okay. On medicines, um, <coughs> whether we look at primary care on the left, secondary care in the middle, or total, there is an overall growth. The overall growth is still higher than NHS and DH and Treasury forecast. That's why the PPRS payments went up, as we all, we all know now. Um, so what DH and NHS England have done, this is one that um, I won't send out unless I get the go ahead, somebody's asking if I can send it out as it is, this is an NHS England slide, it kind of tells I think quite a nice story of what they're trying to do and it starts off over on the far left hand side just above the green bubble um, with a strategy, so the green bits are components of the system, the blue bits are the DH policy and the bubbles are stages. So we start on the left, you have life sciences products that go through some sort of a regulatory process after they're developed, and they make it ready. Then they go into the pricing system, into PPRS. Then they go into NICE, or some other kind of a, a full hurdle. Then they go into prescribers and pharmacists to decide whether they, they should actually be used um, to the, or for the final purpose of treating the patient on the far right. And what NHS is going to have is a plan that each stage of these um, which I've been told I will get as a supplementary, which I can then say back to you. So they have a plan for each step of that to try and tackle the problems that they think we have as an industry. Now, they, being the NHS England, Bolts and DH, meet with Photi ADPI at quite a high level with the Ministerial Industry Strategy Group and other groups. They engage far more broadly now, including organisations like EMI, UCO in Europe, and others. And so they, they think they have a good idea about what our problems are. Therefore, they are imposing solutions that they think will help. So the PPRS wasn't entirely a selfish act of let's grab everything we can from industry. It was also partly giving industry what they thought we wanted. Now, I think, well, I don't know, show fans who in the room thinks PPRS works out relatively badly for industry. It's quite a few people not got their hands up, okay. Who thinks it worked relatively well for industry? Okay, I'm presuming the others are upsetting or just maybe a bit shy. Uh, we'll be able to run around the room in a minute wake up here. Um, but PPRS was an example of things that didn't work out quite so well for industry, but actually was a fantastic result for Treasury. They got a huge windfall. Most of that money that was a windfall was not actually allocated to CCGs, as you heard in response to a parliamentary question, because how could it possibly have been reallocated to CCGs when they didn't know what the top was? So if you've already calculated the sum of money that CCGs are going to receive for next year, um, how could you possibly take into account a, a, a hike in the rebate that's coming through the PRS, unless you account for that in latter years and you give extra money to CCGs? In which case, if anyone works in CCG, I think we've got one or two, um, if you uh, believe that, then you should get a nice extra allocation of money for 2016-17 because of the PRS payments went up. So that's one example. They've also looked at different metrics and uh, uptakes. So they've got the nice innovation scorecard, which is kind of helpful if you're a company. Um, they've improved the speed of nice appraisals, which um, I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but they've certainly tried, so whether it will wash out as a re-improvement, I'm not sure yet. 
nicely supplementary advice that does allow greater flexibility, so they can say yes to all medicines that are higher ISA, such as end of life medicines. The Cancer Drugs Fund is, is an interesting political uh, boost, as we know. Did it really work? Mm. Not really sure. Was it the right thing to do for cancer? Is cancer really more special than Alzheimer's or something else? Mm. Personally, no, but that's a, that's a personal opinion. Future actions introduce things like value-based pricing. <laughs> yeah, I'll believe you. Um, I don't know whether that will work, but even if it does work, which I think it would be good if it did, we won't see it until the 1st of January 2019. So we can talk about it later <coughs> over the next two or three years, but we won't see it active until 2019. An earlier access scheme designed to make promising new medicines available quicker is kind of here in PIMS. Um, you've also got EMS, Early Access to Medicine Scheme. Um, I have a personal view on it, which isn't terribly positive because there's no money coming with that. If you get adaptive license through the EMA, then great, because you should get money earlier through NICE because it's a regulated product and it's properly licensed. And NICE will have said yes to it, so it's all linked. But if you're not in that, then I don't really see, see the particular benefit. So, in conclusion, and then I'll hand you over to our next speaker. Um, the NHS space is a mammoth challenge. There's lots of opportunities for disruptive technology, particularly those that you can leverage early to reduce short-term uh, spend. That's where the, the biggest bang for your buck is. Um, one of our clients is a diagnostics company, and they have products that could theoretically save the NHS billions. But even they find it hard to get into the NHS because of all the hurdles. In just the, the first assumption is it's probably expensive, let's say no. And then, oh, really? Oh, maybe. But if they're finding it struggle, how on earth do the rest of us manage? So I think the NHS has still got some way to go before we can say that it's, uh, it, it's, it's um, fast and low uh, rather than slow and low. So George Freeman's quoted several times by saying we have a, a low price market, but it's also quite slow to market. We don't necessarily mind a low price market as a global, uh, a global view, as long as it's fast. If it's a no, just please do it quickly. And there are some issues here about uh, PPRS and medicines optimization. <coughs> this is kind of a placeholder for later in the day, so let's not forget that in the discussions. And finally, I don't know, as, uh, do a quick show of hands. Has anyone, anyone heard of Rose versus Thanet court case about a year or two ago? Okay. So, be interesting to you. Uh, so Rose is a patient, Thanet is a CCG. Uh, there was a court case in the last two years, I can't remember exactly when, I think at the beginning of last year, where a patient wanted to get access to a, a treatment and the CCG said mm, no. Um, it wasn't quite as simple. But the CCG said no, the patient didn't like it, took it further. Eventually there was a court case. And the interesting bit for you is to think about nice clinical guidelines as you would a nice technology appraisal. Because legally, the result of this court case is that there is UK law now as a precedent to say anything that NICE produces a guideline stroke of guidance should be duly considered by any public authority in their spending plans. So that means that NICE technology appraisals have a mandatory funding requirement if they're given a funding direction by NICE. You should kind of look at guidelines and public health guidance and anything else with the same view, unless proven otherwise. So if a CCG or uh, NHS England hasn't properly considered what's in a nice anything, then there is now a legal precedent to uh, certain grapple cages and people get quite worried about it, but they'll at least give it the attention it deserves instead of maybe a knife. 